We have a grand time. The church is packed. We usually have a choir in the back of us. At least 40, 50, 60 uh, people sing in the choir. The band is all around. The people are there to receive the word of God. But today we cannot be gathered together. But we still do not want to be able to miss the opportunity um, to rehearse even those last seven words, those things that we hear. Even though we hear them over and over they still bless our soul. So thank you today uh, for joining us on today, and I wanted to share some of those with you even on today. We'll start with some of the songs that we sing at the cross, uh, Calvary, There's No Greater Love, and uh, thank God for our brother Christian Warren, brother Adrian Norwood, amen, and we'll play some of those songs. You can sing along with us perhaps at home or wherever you are, amen, and then after that, I'll uh, share with you uh, the word of God, beginning with the seven words and the message that the Lord has laid on my heart for today. The Lord bless you, and thanks for joining us. Amen.
glory.
about the results of the cross beyond the last seven words. Usually at this time we would be here and we would be talking about um, uh, we would have had different people that would present each of the words on the cross. I want to kind of remind you about those words because Good Friday would not be the same to us if we were not able to hear those words. But today we would have heard now from Luke uh, 23, 34. Uh, those verses that are very familiar where Jesus starts by saying, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they're doing. Amen. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they're doing. And many times we've heard messages on this, and we understand from this that we understand not only about the forgiveness of the Lord Jesus Christ, but we learn about his love and his compassion, amen, that he had for all of us. And we learn from him from this instance that we need to be able to forgive people no matter what they're doing for us. They jeered at him. They called him names. They did everything. But he said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they're doing. The next word from the cross, we would hear a message and someone would expound upon this. Luke 19, verses 26 and 27. And here we hear those familiar words where Jesus was talking to John and as he was looking down and seeing his mother down there around the cross and Jesus would say uh, to John, behold, um, or to his mother, behold thy son. And then to John, he would say, behold thy mother, John 19, verse 26 and 27. And from this, we learn about the, the Lord's compassion and care and concern for his mother. Uh, one of the things I like to say when I look at this particular portion of scripture is that I would call John the paraclete at this point. Well, we remember when Jesus says, I will send you another comforter um, that will come in my place. That word he used there is I'll send you another meaning of paraclete. In other words, I'm going to send one just like me. And when I look at this, I'm thinking about when he said to his mother, behold thy son. In other words, he says, I'm leaving one just like me. Just like I'm sending the Holy Spirit for the believers, Mom, I'm sending you one just like me. Behold thy son. I say at this point, this is uh, Jesus paraclete. John is going to be one that's going to care for you like I would care for you, love you like I would care. And he says to John, I want you to care for her as if she was your own mother. The next word somebody would preach on at this time would come out of Luke 23, verse 43. And those words we're very familiar with where he says, today thou shalt be with me in paradise. And we remember this portion of the scripture, it's where the thief was hanging on the cross. Uh, there were two that were hanging with him. One railed at him, one mocked him, one said some things that uh, a, a humble person would not say. But the one looked at him and said, uh, Father, I realize I have sinned. I, I, I realize, I recognize who you are, and I recognize who I am, and truly I am nothing. I'm not worthy to be here. He says, if you would just remember me when you come into your kingdom, and you know the words of Jesus at that point where he says, today, Thou shalt be with me in paradise. Uh, he had compassion for that thief that hung next to him. Even though he was guilty of his charges, Jesus set him free from his sin, even at that point. Amen. Thank God that Jesus gives all of us a pardon and a promise. Uh, no matter how bad, no matter how dark, no matter how ugly our sin, Jesus is willing to forgive us and to give us eternal salvation. Yes, today thou shalt be with me in paradise. 
And then someone else would come and they would preach this word out of John 19, verse 28, where Jesus cries out and he says, I thirst. And, and we know this is how uh, uh, when Jesus was suffering, we know physically he really was thirsty. Physically he was parched. He was at a place of thirst in the natural sense. Um, but we also suggest many times, not just in the natural sense, there was a spiritual thirsting going on in his life. Um, hallelujah. Even at this point. He had a thirsting, I would suggest, for his heavenly fellowship with his father. He had been separated from his father and I believe that as the scripture tells us that we are to hunger and thirst after righteousness, I believe that he hungered and thirsted even for that fellowship again with his father. His father. And not only for his father, I believe that he had a thirst for the souls of the people who would die and those people who would be lost. I, I believe that he had a thirst for those that did not want to hear his word, that did not want to receive his way of reconciliation he had a thirst for those souls. Not only that, we would hear someone else come and they would preach to us out of this particular verse, Matthew 26, verse 46. And we would hear those words, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And we've heard this preached to us over and over again. And we've heard that this speaks about his personal anguish. Uh, his feeling now that his father had forsaken him. Uh, amen. And, and, and Jesus was still doing what he was supposed to do. But where was his father at this time? Oh, what a feeling it is for us to think that our parents, that our family, that those closest to us have forsaken or abandoned us. Uh, uh, and it lets us see here that Jesus not only was God, but he also was man. He, we call it the hypostatic union. In other words, in his humanity, in his flesh, he had felt forsaken. Even though he knew that his father in the spiritual sense would never forsake him, in the natural or the fleshly sense, he had felt forsaken at this time. Amen. In his humanity, he felt the anguish. Amen. And then someone else will come along around John 19, verse 30. Amen. And we would hear these words, it is finished. He was thirsty and they gave him something to drink. And he says, it is finished. And understand that when we talk about this finish, this was not a finish in the sense of giving up. This was not a finish in the sense of, I'm done, I quit, I'm surrender, I'm out of here. It was not a, a finish in the sense of retiring, but this was a finish in the sense of victory. In other words, my task has been accomplished. I, I'm finished the work that I have been brought here to do. You know we believe that, that Jesus, amen, was with God the Father in the beginning, amen, and when God decided how he was going to send a redeemer for man, he sent his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. Jesus had a job to do, amen, even in the garden when he says, nevertheless, not my will, but your be, will be done. In other words, he says, now my work is finished. Hallelujah. It's an accomplished task. And we need to make sure that whatever it is God has called us to do, that we'll be able to say to him, amen, Lord, it is finished. Not because I give up, God, because I've done everything you've assigned my heart to do. And then finally, we hear these words that we would usually hear in our Good Friday service. Luke 23, 46. It says, commending his spirit into his father's hands. In other words, it says, Father, I now commit my spirit. I commend my spirit into your hands. This is another time when Jesus sets before us a wonderful example. Imagine his concern now at death was not about his body, but it was about his assurance and guarantee of his soul and his spirit. We cannot be overly concerned in this life about our bodies Amen. But we ought to be concerned about our spirit and our soul and making sure that when we close our eyes on this side, that our spirit is in the hands of the Lord, that our soul is in the hands of the Lord. Even today, with all that's going on right here, people are very much worried about their body. They're worried about their respiratory system. They're worried about their immune system. And there's no doubt all of us should be concerned about that. But the most important thing we ought to be able to say is, Father, I commend my spirit into your hands. I, I want to make sure 
sure that my soul is right with God. No matter what happens to me on the outside, no matter what happens to my flesh, even as Job said, even though the skin worms may destroy my flesh, hallelujah, Job was convinced that he was going to see God in the end times. Why? Because his soul was right with God. So when I hear Jesus say, Father, I commend my hands into your spirit. I want us to be reminded today that that's what needs to be our confidence. That needs to be our testimony. Father, I commend my soul, my spirit into your hands. And no matter what happens to me on the outside, no matter what I'm afflicted with from my head to my feet, I want to make sure that when I'm absent from this body, that I'm present with the Lord. Because I know my soul is anchored in the Lord. My soul, my spirit is anchored in you. Uh, that's what I see from Jesus. But you know, truthfully, most of these sayings, when we read them, when we preach them, they wouldn't really give us an indication that this is a good Friday. But when I take a glimpse of what happened just beyond these words, we just might see how this really is a good Friday. We want to talk to you about that even on this day. Hallelujah. celebrate so much on Good Friday when I hear all these words that Jesus said sound like words of gloom and doom, but not words of goodness. But I want you to go with me to Matthew chapter 27, and I want to start reading at verse 55, uh, because I really want to talk about the day beyond the last seven words, and we can see the results of the cross. So go with me there, Matthew chapter 7, 27 beginning at verse 51, amen, verse 51, beginning at, amen. <clears throat> it says, at that moment, uh, some translators say then, some say immediately, some say and behold, uh, some say at once, but nonetheless it's saying right after these words, right after Jesus had said these words, amen, then immediately, Hallelujah, the, cur the, the curtain of the temple, hallelujah, was torn in two, he says, from the bottom up. The earth shook and the rocks split. The tombs broke open and the bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. He said, verse 53, they came out of the tombs and after Jesus resurrected, um, after Jesus' resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many people. When the centurion, verse 54, and those who were with him that were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and all that had happened, remember, immediately this happened, they were terrified and he exclaimed, surely this was the Son of God. Verse 55, many women were there 
watching from a distance. They had followed Jesus from Galilee to care for his needs. And among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and uh, Joseph or John, and the mother of Zebedee's sons. Amen. At that moment. I want to talk, amen, as we continue with these last seven words, but beyond the seven words. One of the first things it says that happened here is that after that it says the veil of the temple was torn from top to bottom, bottom to top. It was torn at this time. In other words, remember with the veil, the veil was the thing that kept us from entering to the Holy of Holies. The veil was the thing that kept us really from coming to God and see him who he was. But this time when Jesus died, when Jesus said, it is finished. When Jesus said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit, it says, immediately then, at once, behold, others said, the veil of the temple. In other words, at that time, now there was nothing that would separate us from being able to come into the throne of God. That's why I like the scripture that says, uh, now as children of God, we can come boldly unto the throne of grace. Uh, there's no veil that separates God and us. We can come to him. So immediately what happened? That makes this a good Friday. Up until this time, you could not approach God. Uh, up until this time, if you tried to go into the temple, hallelujah, it was a death wish. But now you can go into the temple and it can be a life dream. Hallelujah. Just coming into the temple. Hallelujah. I'm glad about that. Only the pure blood of the sacrificial lamb sprinkled on the hand of the high priest was permitted to get close. But now because of the shed blood of Jesus Christ, all of us have access all of us can be cleansed. I mean, that's what happened beyond the word. Hallelujah. I'm excited about that. The veil was rent. Uh, Hebrew says, let us now approach the throne of grace now with confidence uh, so that we can receive mercy and we can find grace to help us in our time of need. Whatever it is you're going through right now, I want you to know that you can come to the throne of grace. You can find God's mercy in the time of your need. If you don't understand what's going on, because Jesus said it is finished, you can come to him. You can talk to him. Hallelujah. He said, I come, the songwriter says, to the garden alone, even while the dudes are still on the road. He said, he talks with me, he walks with me, and he tells me I am his own. Oh, yeah. Hallelujah. Oh, I got to remember. It's just me. Amen. All right. Let me, let me calm down. I know. Preach, Pastor. Oh, I hear a voice. <laughs> Before it was certain death to enter in, but now it is certain death to stay out. This happened. So we're looking in the scripture. It says what? The temple was destroyed. Understand, it's not so much the physical structure. But what the structure represented now was destroyed. It was the structure that separated sometimes man from true access to God. So no more was Jesus himself a temple, but when he gave up the ghost, he was no longer separated from his father. For he said, now I commend my spirit unto you. While he was down here in the flesh, there was a separation. While he was in this temple, there was a separation between him and the Father. But now when he let the body go, he says, now I commend my spirit unto you. And now he's back with him. So sometimes our temple, our flesh, hallelujah, can get in the way of our communion and our union with God. Amen. And that's why Paul says we've got to die daily to the things of the flesh. Sometimes it's our temple that keeps us from communing with God. And that's what happened when Jesus died. The temple was destroyed. We've got to destroy our temple, not so much the physical body that we're walking in, but the, what the temple represents. And the temple represents flesh. It represents that that separates us from time from God. Hallelujah. This was destroyed. This happened after the words. As we keep looking in that, he says we hear the rocks. Verse 51. It says, and the rocks became rent. How amazing it is that when Jesus, who is the rock, yeah. when they smote him, the rocks of the earth became agitated. Yeah. Amen. They smote the rock. Yeah. 
and all of the rocks became agitated. It said there was an earthquake and all the earth shook and the rocks became agitated. Why? Because they had attacked the rock. Oh, hallelujah. Amen. I, 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 I've been to Israel. I've been to Jerusalem. I've seen the ancient rocks. I've seen those rocks that have been upturned because of earthquakes. Those that have been uh, uh, torn asunder uh, because of time. And I mean, some of those rocks are big boulders uh, weighing thousands and thousands of pounds. But when they struck Jesus on the cross, the Bible says those same rocks uh, became agitated. And the earth things started moving. I've seen those rocks. How amazing it is that when people no longer praise the rock of ages, the rocks began to cry out. Hallelujah. To say, certainly, this was the Son of God. How amazing that when the rock was smote, the living water freed slowly, just as when Moses smote the rock in the desert, and the living water flowed. There's something about when you smite the rock, God has a way of giving living water. He told Jesus, the people, or Moses, the people said they're thirsty. He told Moses, take your rod and smoke the rock. And when he smoked the rock, the water came out, and the people were able to live. Well, here goes Jesus hanging on the cross. And the Bible said they pierced him in the side. They put a crown of thorns over his head. In other words, they smoked the rock. But then they said, look, not only was blood, but water was coming out of the side. When they smoked the rock, we were given living water. Oh yes, that was a good Friday. Hallelujah. Now we can have the living water. Oh yeah. The Bible not only says that, but it also says that there were some other unnatural events that occurred. It said darkness came upon the face of the earth. Hallelujah. Because they had smoked the light of the world. Hallelujah. All of the world became dark. And this happened immediately after the words. Amen. And yes, this makes it a good Friday. Hallelujah. Because the Bible says in verse 52 and verse 53 that those that were dead became alive. Oh yeah. The Bible says all of us were dead in our trespasses and sins. But because of Jesus, we have become alive. Because Jesus died, we are alive. I'm telling you, that happened on that day. After the cross, after accepting Jesus through the shed blood of Jesus Christ, we who are dead, we are now alive. For Romans said we are now alive to Christ, even when we were dead in our trespasses and sins. I just want to say it was a good Friday, and we've got something to celebrate. Not just the words of doom and gloom, but what happened immediately after the words. After these things, hallelujah, because the crater of the earth was being crucified. How could the earth keep silent when the one who has created her is being threatened? What home could remain calm if the head was being threatened? What kingdom could remain quiet if the king was being threatened? What church could remain still and quiet if their pastor was being threatened? Hallelujah. Because Jesus died, we all came alive. He was and he is the Alpha and the Omega. He's the first and he's the last. He's the beginning and he's the end. He's the creator of heaven and the creator of earth. But now this Jesus was the place suspended between heaven and earth with a crown of thorns on his head. Who else could upset the earth like this? Who else could change the course of nature? Jesus himself. The Bible says in verse 54 that when the centurion and those who are around him, when they saw what happened, when they heard the words that he said, when they saw the earthquake, when they saw darkness come upon the face of the lives, hallelujah, of their lives, the Jordan, the Jordan said, surely, 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 
Jesus must be the Son of God. He's not just a child of Mary. He's not just a mere prophet. He's not just a good man. But surely, he's the Son of God. Hallelujah. These centurions, they were soldiers. They were unbelievers. They were Romans. They were Gentiles. They were persecuted of Jesus. But when they saw what he had done, they proclaimed it certainly is the Son of God. When we look at the things that Jesus has done, when you see people's lives change from what they used to be to what they are now, when you see those who were suffering from sickness and disease, but now they're healed and they're whole. When you see those who were full of hatred and dishonesty, and now they're walking in love and truth, who else could have changed them but Jesus Christ? We truly look at the life of Christ and the death of Jesus and the results of his life and death. We should have a testimony just like the centurion. They were convicted and they were convinced and they must have found that surely this is the Son of God. Surely he is the King of Kings. Surely he is the Lord of Lords. And now we can crown him Lord. Who is this King of Glory? Who is this King of Glory? The Lord, the mighty God, He's the King of Glory and the host of hosts. Because of His death, because of His shed blood, because of His victory over the grave, we too will one day wear a crown. I don't know what your crown will look like. I'm not sure what my crown will look like. But one day, just like Jesus, I'm going to wear a crown. I'm going to wear a crown. I'm going to put on my feet when my feet is low. I'm going to have a story to tell when I have my new crown on. All because Jesus died. All because he shed his blood. All because on a good Friday, things were never the same in Jesus' name. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord bless you. And may the Lord keep you. As we remember, after the last seven words, there were some amazing things that happened, which makes this Good Friday. The Lord bless you. The Lord smile. Keep his countenance upon you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.